To one person who loves the opera, this is like the greatest prize in the world. But to the person right next to them that hates the opera, that's there because they were dragged there by their spouse, it's going to be a terrible experience. When is this thing going to be over? What's with all the screaming and the yelling and the singing? Enough already! So it's the same thing, the same experience that they're exposed to, but for one person it's really enjoyable, And for the other person, it's hell. This is similar to the way in which the soul works and the soul experiences truth in the afterlife. One of the first things for us to think about is the idea that you and I are in eternal existence, that we tend to think of ourselves as people, as humans, as bodies that have a spiritual experience from time to time, where in reality, we are eternally spiritual experiences, we are eternally spiritual creatures, we are souls that happen to, for now, temporarily be having a physical experience. It's kind of counter to the way in which we tend to think of things. And the truth of the matter is, is that it makes logical and reasonable sense to understand that there is a continuation to our soul, to our consciousness, to our being, following its occupation, following its time with the body. And the reason that it makes sense is because, think about scientifically, okay? When you have a body that is no longer living, and five minutes ago it was considered alive, the person was considered alive, So something, that life force that made the person alive, that energy that was in them, that was making them a living being, is no longer there. Where did it go? The energy has got to go somewhere. It can't just disappear. Energy is not created or destroyed. Whatever was making that body, that being alive, It's got to go somewhere. Now, again, the where it goes, that's already religious or, or philosophical or spiritual speak, but conceptually it makes sense that the energy's got to go somewhere. It continues on somewhere. So we're going to talk about the Jewish view of where and what that somewhere looks like. One of the things that is also important to keep in mind is the idea that when we bury someone into the ground, it's like, they, it's like putting them back into the womb of the earth. The idea is that the death process and going into the ground is sort of paralleling in reverse what happens at birth. So at birth, someone, a, a child, a baby is born, comes out of his mother's womb and is born into this world. And after that person lives their life, that person is put back as intact into into the womb of the earth and born somewhere else, born into an afterlife, a spiritual experience. That's the premise. And the idea is like planting a seed. When we plant a seed into the ground, that seed deteriorates. And through that process, new life comes out from that. It's born a a giant redwood tree that was contained only in potential in that small seed. So it's through the planting the seed in the ground and it deteriorating that the redwood tree eventually comes about from it. That life springs forth from the deteriorated seed. Now, it's interesting When you go around the Jewish community and you talk to people and you ask them, do Jews believe in the afterlife? Do Jews believe in heaven? Do Jews believe in hell? Is there any sort of afterlife experience out there? Many people are under the misconception that Jews don't believe in an afterlife. In fact, a lot of people that I've dealt with 
Jewish people have told me, well, I'm jealous of my Christian friends when they're going through hardship, when they're going through loss, because at least they believe in an afterlife. And I'm like, hello? I'm like, where do you think they got that idea from? But the concept of an afterlife is certainly premised in Judaism, something certainly that we have. Why is it that so many Jews don't think that we believe in an afterlife? There's really two reasons. Number one, in Jewish tradition, to make the cut is fairly simple in a a certain manner of speaking. The Mishnah says, kol Yisrael, every Jewish person has a share in the world to come just by being part of that people. But the, the second reason is because you don't really find a lot of discussion about the afterlife in the synagogue. However often you attend a synagogue, you don't often hear the rabbi talking at length, certainly, about our belief in the afterlife and being good here so you can get a better afterlife. In other faiths, the afterlife is a central theme. You got to do good here. You got to be a good person here. You got to do the right thing here because then you're going to go to heaven. But in Jewish circles, you go to synagogue, you don't really hear that as a motivator for doing the right thing. And the reason that the afterlife is not given such a prominent place, although it's certainly part of our belief, is because the value that Judaism places is on this world and its challenges. Elevating, uplifting, affecting this world, making a difference in this world, bringing godliness out in this world. In fact, the mission in Perkei Avos and in the ethics of our father says one hour and good deeds and, and repentance in this world is better than all of the entirety of the world to come. And what's the reason for that? Because in this world, we have the ability to cause our Creator delight. When we do the right thing in this world, we delight God. We bring pleasure to God. The next world is all about God bringing delight and pleasure to us based on a reward for the good deeds that we've done. So this world is about bringing delight to God. The next world is about God bringing delight to us. So our focus as Jews, our focus in our faith is bringing delight to God, not focusing on what, how God is going to delight me. That's the reason. So other faiths try to bring the man to heaven Judaism brings heaven into the man during his life. We bring heaven down to earth. That is our idea. That is the premise of what we believe. Another interesting factoid, another reason that the afterlife is not really discussed so much, it's not a main focus, is because of the fact, the, if you'll notice in the Torah, the very first letter of the Torah is the letter bet, the letter base. And one of the things that our sages teach is if you look at the graphic of the letter bet, of the letter base, you'll find something interesting. On the top, it's closed off. On the the back, it's closed off. On the bottom, it's closed off. The only place that is open is moving forward, is the here and the now, is the present. In other words, the idea of Torah, the premise of Torah, is not to focus so much on what's in the upper worlds, on what's in the lower worlds, on what happened before God created the universe, for lack of a better term. Not to think too much about that, not to obsess and make that the central thing. The central theme is the here and the now, affecting this world. But Philosophically, it makes sense to believe in an afterlife. There's a, there was a great meme, a great little postcard, a little picture that was going around a bunch of years ago, and it really hit home for a lot of people. The picture was of twins in, in utero. It was a, it was a, 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 
a sonogram, a picture of, of, a, of, a, of a little baby in, the, in, the, in a fetus in its mother's womb. And one cartoon baby was saying to the other cartoon baby in the womb, said, do you believe that there's life after birth? Right? Do you believe that there's life after birth? And after sitting in the mother's womb for nine months, the baby, the all existence that it knows is in the confines of its mother's womb. All the lifestyle and the way in which it functions is within the mother's womb. He looks back at his twin and says, no, life after birth, come on, have you ever even seen mom? And it hit home for a lot of people because in our womb of the earth, as we discussed uh, before, the idea is we think that reality and eternity, everything that we, know, that we experience is the end all and be all of existence. However, there is a God behind the scenes, there is a God that sustains us, and there is a bigger and broader world beyond what the five senses will give us. So the purpose of the afterlife is for improvement and not reprovement. It's not to punish us, it's not to hurt us if we did the wrong things, if we did things that need improvement. It's to improve us, it's to bring us to where we need to be. Heaven and hell are not the ultimate, right? Hell and purgatory, which we're going to get into shortly, is a mechanism, is a means to get to the right place. Now, afterlife is not mentioned in Scripture. It's, it's not discussed very much. Very, uh, and in fact, it's in, in the text of the Hebrew Bible, do you know how many times the afterlife is referenced? None. None. And the reason, the reason, first of all, it's, it's mentioned tremendously in the oral tradition, the Talmudic, Midrashic, and mystical texts. But the reason that the, it's not in the written text of the Torah is because the written Torah is not an abstract or esoteric text. If you open it up, it's very practical and speaks to people from all places and all times. It speaks in the language that's clear to whether you're a farmer 3,000 years ago or someone today that we can understand why I need to do what I'm doing. It uses rudimentary language, not esoteric, it's not abstract, it's a pragmatic, and it's intended for the many. It speaks to the average person. Doesn't matter what your IQ is, doesn't matter how spiritual you are, Noth it speaks in very practical language. Do this, you'll be rewarded. Do this, you will be not rewarded. And the language that's used in the Torah for reward is if you do what you're supposed to do, you're going to get the rains in their time, which for a farmer is really relevant, really important. And if you don't do the things that you're supposed to do, you're not going to get the rains in their time. Now, the oral tradition and certainly the midrashic and the mystical texts explain the spiritual elements behind that and what spiritually all that means. But even for someone that doesn't understand anything spiritual, and, and operates completely in an agricultural society, whether you're 3,000 years ago or right now, or 3,000 years in the future, you can understand what I need to do and why I need to do it. The Hebrew Bible, the text, is very pragmatic. There's, no, there's no, nothing enigmatic about, about it. However, however, just so you know, well, you know, a little secret. There are times where even the written Torah does hint to an afterlife. For example, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Aaron, Moses, when they pass away, what is the, what is the language that the Torah uses? It tells us that they were gathered to their people. Now, it's interesting because Abraham was the first in his line. Right? It can't be physically he was gathered to his people. He had no people. He was the guy. Moses and Aaron were both buried alone, if you'll recall from the Torah text. So when it says that they were gathered to their people, clearly it's not talking about something physical. 
Again, you got to understand it a little bit deeper to get that point. But the truth remains that gather to your people means something spiritual. Additionally, there's a commandment in the Torah, in Vayikra, in the book of Leviticus, that contact with the dead is something that's forbidden by Jewish law. And if you want to take that at face value, what's the commandment? You're not allowed to talk to the dead means that there's someone to talk to. That after a person passes away, that there is a soul, that there is a spiritual existence that can be interacted with. And you're forbidden from doing that, but that the existence is there. So the Torah, which again doesn't on the surface make any reference to an afterlife, passively refers to the, the continued existence of the soul. There's, there's other commandments that the, the punishment, the severity that's stressed for it is, the, is kares, means the soul is cut off. And what that means is that this is not something that happens in his lifetime, that spiritually speaking, that they are, they are distanced from God in an afterlife. That is the punishment that is being discussed. So again, there's not open discussion because the written Torah is not an esoteric text on the surface, but it does contain hints for those that are looking at something beyond the grave. Now, what does the Talmud say are the questions that a person is asked following their passing. When you get up to the afterlife, what are the questions that we are presented with? I hope you're taking notes because this is what we got to really say. <laughs> right. Question number one, out of all the things we do, out of all of our lifetime, what's the first question the Talmud says that we are asked? The Gemara in Shabbos says, were you honest in your business dealings? Second thing, did you establish time to study Torah? Third question, did you involve yourself in bearing, raising, or assisting the upbringing of the next generation? Did you look forward to and anticipate the coming of Mashiach? Did you converse in areas of wisdom? So these are the practical questions. How did you utilize that time that you spent in that world? When you went to schoolhouse earth, what did you learn? How did you act? So after a person passes, they are, our tradition teaches, judged. And judge is, we're going we're gonna to use this in a term where the, the soul engages with truth. The soul engages with God, with truth, with the heavenly court. And depending on how it lived in this world will be how it's judged. Meaning that if I lived a life that's one way, that is in a good way, well, when I'm confronted with God and truth and goodness... It's going to be a very uplifting experience. If I acted a different way, if I was engaged and fully occupied in materialism and that was the only thing that was important to me, well, then going to a purely spiritual existence might be a very, very challenging sort of process. And the soul confronts its life and its life is examined. We're taught in the mission on the ethics of our fathers, Perkei it says that all a person's deeds are recorded in a book. And one, one modern way that we can kind of make sense of that, one, one thing that might bring even a more clear imagery, is that all of our actions are recorded. You ever watch yourself on a recording, whether it's a home movie or a video from a bunch of years ago, and you're like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I was wearing that, I can't believe I did that, I can't believe, whatever it is, and you're like embarrassed watching yourself do whatever it is that you were doing. So the soul has a movie, the, the movie is your life starring you, where your soul gets to re-experience and engaged with how it utilized its time on schoolhouse earth, on, in this physical world. So it's interesting, 
our minds remember everything. Our minds really file away everything. In, in fact, philosopher Henry Bergson said that the brain doesn't produce sensations, but it acts as a reducing valve for all the sensations and memories that would pour into our mind at once. So the brain just sort of acts as a filter, but it, rem it really remembers. That's why when a person gets hypnotized or, or whatnot, it, it achieves a, a, a various states of, of consciousness and awareness, that they can remember things things that consciously they had long forgotten about. It's because all of our deeds are remembered in this book. All of our deeds are remembered. The soul remembers what it did, for good, for better, or for worse, while it spent its time in this world. So the afterlife, the experience, can either be something really enjoyable if the soul lived up to the expectations that it was given, if it lived a good life, a godly life, then being confronted with truth is going to be a very special and uplifting and wonderful thing, very enjoyable. But if the opposite is true, being confronted with truth and with goodness and, and seeing where it, where it veered from its path and its potential, that could be a very not-so-great experience, to say the least. And so one thing that I think it's very important for us to understand when we talk about things like heaven, hell, purgatory, all of these terms that we like to throw around, a lot of people think, well, Jews don't believe in hell. Jews don't believe in purgatory. Jews don't believe in all sorts of things. And the truth is that what we mean, it's not that we don't believe in those things. It's that we don't believe in those things in the way that they are typically conceived of. So in other words, if we say, it's not that we don't believe in hell or purgatory, it's just not the way it's depicted in the movies. So there is a concept of hell or purgatory, but it's not like you watch on film. It's not like devils and pitchforks and lava and goblins. The idea is much more related to a emotional or spiritual anguish that the soul has based on the way that it lived, lived its life. If you see that you didn't reach your potential, if you see that you could have done so much more, if you experience and watch the, all of the errors that you made, it's not going to be a pleasant emotional, spiritual experience. And sometimes in our lives, we say, well, that doesn't sound that bad, but sometimes emotional pain can be as much or more than physical pain. Like sometimes I'm like, I'd rather just, you know, I'd rather just physically hurt myself than, than emotionally be scarred. Have, so so the, the emotional or spiritual processing is something that is related. It's an experience that we have. Heaven and hell, the afterlife, is not a place. We can't travel 500 years, 500 light years up and we get to heaven, and 500 light years down is to hell. That's the way we typically conceive of it based on the movies. Oh, you go up to heaven and you go down to hell. There's no up and down in spiritual terminology. Up and down, going up spiritually means becoming more refined. Going down spiritually means becoming less refined. And so the afterlife, heaven and hell, is more about your experience and confrontation with truth than it is about going to a place. I'm going to give you an example. True story. I grew up in Florida, and much like California, where we are today, it's really hot, especially in the summertime. So when I was four years old, I was playing outside on my patio with all the typical things that a four-year-old might be playing with. So I had my crayons, and I had my Play-Doh, and my Legos, and all sorts of different toys and games to play with. So I went inside, I had my lunch, and my toys, my crayons, my Play-Doh, they, they had been sitting outside for an hour till I came back. Now, after my toys, had been baking in the hot Florida sun for an hour, what happened to my crayons? My crayons melted. What happened to my Play-Doh? It didn't, right, it didn't melt. It got harder, got stronger. 
So in other words, the same cause, the same sun, the same heat caused two completely different reactions. It caused the, the crayons to weaken, the crayons melted, whereas the Play-Doh hardened. It got stronger. The same sun, the same cause, the same heat. And this is very much what the afterlife experience is like. Heaven and hell, the experience of how your soul engages with God and with truth. If a person lived a life that was devoid of God, where they were running from God, or not interested in God, or living a spiritually minded life, integrating spirituality into their life, avoiding their mission, well then, being exposed to truth and your potential to God is going to be, like my crayons, a, an experience that is weakening us. It makes us feel like, you know, it, it, we melt away. Not, not in the literal sense, but it, it, is a, it is a process where the soul feels like anguish. However, on the other hand, again, like my, like my Plato, exposed to the same atmosphere, the same cause, the effect is going to be differently. If I lived a life in sync with God and doing my best to be in line with what God has uh, prescribed for us for life, for what we need to be doing and where our focus needs to be, well, then that encounter with God and that encounter with truth, again, the same experience, is going to be a very pleasurable experience. It's going to, like my Plato, strengthen me, strengthen our soul, strengthen our experience. It's going to be something experienced as pleasure. Again, same atmosphere, different reaction, different experience. And so, one can't enjoy divinity, one can't enjoy spirituality if their, if their worldview, if their enjoyment is still in the material world. Now, a soul, when it lives in our body for X amount of years, it becomes accustomed to engaging with reality through the means of the body, through the vehicle that is the body. And so, if the soul for X amount of years, 120 years, engages with reality uh, purely in a materialistic sense and enjoys, you know, it makes itself the vehicle to enjoy only food and enjoy only physical pleasures and only physical experiences and has nothing outside the scope of the material world, well, it's not going to enjoy, certainly not right away, going to heaven, experiencing God. Because a person can't enjoy, a soul can't enjoy divinity, spirituality, if his enjoyment still lies in earthly matters. There are no free tickets, there are no sneaking in to Gan Eden, right, into, into having a positive experience with God. It's something that has to be sort of learned, it has to be readapted. A free ticket to a concert is not a present to someone that doesn't enjoy the music. Remember those radio contests they used to have where, you know, before they had Google and before you can easily look up answers to things, uh, they would have radio contests where like, okay, the net first person to call in with the right answer is going to win free tickets to this concert. Remember they used to do those things? So imagine, anyone in this room like the opera? Anyone? Anyone hate the opera? All right, so some love the opera, some hate the opera. Let's say that on the radio show, they say, all right, first one to call in gets front row tickets to the opera, right? So everyone calls in, and the person who wins, and maybe, not, maybe didn't realize what the prize was, he realized, okay, the, the prize for him, he doesn't like the opera, and he just won front row tickets to the opera. So you could have two people sitting in the front row to one person who loves the opera, this is like the greatest prize in the world. But to the person right next to them that hates the opera, that's there because they were dragged there by their spouse, it's going to be a terrible experience. When is this thing going to be over? What's with all the screaming and the yelling and the singing? Enough already! So it's the same thing, the same experience that they're exposed to, but for one person it's really enjoyable, and for the other person it's hell! This is similar to the way in which the soul 
works, and the soul experiences truth in the afterlife. There are no free tickets. It's how you're going to experience. So if the soul leaves the body, and after the soul leaves the body, it was engaged in wrong, in, in things that it, it could have done better with throughout the course of life. There were mistakes that were not repented for. There was, uh, not, there was potential not, uh, not upheld. There were, there, were, there were places for improvement, which we all have. Then depending upon what the, uh, what, what the matters were in their life, that soul needs to go through a sort of re-education, a cleansing process. And the goal, again, of all of, the, of all of the steps along the way in the afterlife are in order for the improvement of the soul, not the reprovement of the soul. Again, it's not because God wants to punish us and hurt us and cause emotional, spiritual pain. That's not the reason. It's not to hurt us. But sometimes the process of going through that is very um, is is something that is, is is a painful process. It's for the greater good. Think about it like um, think about it like a washing machine. Imagine you you know you sipping your wine or your grape juice. You spill it on your shirt. Oh man! Well, l- luckily for us, we have things called the washing machine. We throw that shirt in the washing machine. Bada bing! Sixty minutes later, you got a new shirt. Most of the time, unless it's really like strong wine. Any case, imagine you're the shirt. So the, the process of going through the washing machine and the dryer is not a particularly pleasant process, right? It's for the greater good. You're going to get cleaned up. You're going to feel good afterwards, but it ain't a particularly uh, enjoyable experience. You tumbled and you fumbled and that is the experience of the soul. So there are different categories of soul improvement, of soul transitioning to where it needs to be that are discussed in our tradition. So, for example, one of the punishments that is sought out for the soul is chibut hakever, which is the death pangs of the grave. and is a cleansing psychological pain which purifies the soul of all bodily negativity. It's for someone that was very attached to the physical world, this can be a very traumatic experience. Remember, remember if, again, if your preoccupation, if your only enjoyment in life is the physical world, will bring being removed from the physical world and, and, and watching your sort of physical demise happen, that's going to be something that's really not an enjoyable experience, to say the least. Rabbeinu HaKadosh did not benefit from this world. Rebbe, Rabbi Yehuda Anasi, it says he didn't benefit from this world even in the smallest way. And so this particular improvement, this particular method of soul improvement was not necessary for him. He didn't engage, he didn't enjoy, he just, he lived the world. Everything was a means to an end, not an end in and of itself. Aestheticism or self-denial, celibacy, or poverty is not the way in Judaism. We're just supposed to engage with the world as a means to an end. So you should make money, right? But the money, the, the intent behind it should be to do more good with that, to support your family, to host people for Shabbat, to give tzedakah, to do, to make the world a better place. When when we start focusing on what on the means to an end on the money that's where our problems come in alcohol is another thing with in moderation and proper context can make can draw people closer you say lachaim together it brings people together but if it's a, it's a means to an end if it's used as a means to an end it can have great effect but if the alcohol becomes the end in and of itself you run into trouble. If, if your happiness is the alcohol, not a mechanism of bringing you closer to others, and that's your happiness, well, that's, that's where our trouble starts. And in fact, everything in our world, the troubles begin, our problems in life often begin when things that are meant to be a means to an end become an end in and of itself. And so this process 
This corrective process in the afterlife is to correct that particular mindset, worldview, and engagement with the world, that the soul is being purified in that particular way. There's another description of how the soul is cleansed and brought into a state of purity to enjoy the godly experience, and that's called kaf hakela, which is called, uh, is, it's described as a slingshot. And the Talmudic description is that the souls of the wicked are bound up, and an angel stands at one end of the universe and another end of the universe, and they hurl the souls with a sling from one end of an to another, like a big swing. Now, Hasidic philosophy and the Jewish mystics sort of clarify what that means. And the idea is that the soul is hurled from its present state of being aware of divine truth, experiencing divine glory, seeing what it could have been in its potential, and then hurled into its existence that it had in its life, its desire uh, to, to cleave to all of the worldly things and all of the, all of the uh, things that it, that it was preoccupied with in this world. So it's like, this is what you could have been. This is what you could have achieved. This is what truth is. This is what godliness is. This is what it could have been. And then, boom, right back, this is how you live. This is where you were. And that experience of being, of kind of being, of going back and forth is, again, it's not an enjoyable process, but it is a process nonetheless that is a cleansing to the soul. If you want to think about it in a certain way, in a certain degree, it's kind of like the process of therapy. The process of therapy can be I mean, the, certainly the, the end result has tremendous potential. It can improve a person's life uh, in, 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 a, in a completely renewed way. But sometimes the process of going through therapy causes a lot of tears, causes a lot of anger, all of these pent-up emotions that we've never been able to express, they come out. And whether a person is going to, uh, to a therapist for a short period of time or a long period of time, again, the result, the end goal is something that is wonderful for the person, something that could be very beneficial for the person, but the process in between may be something very difficult to confront, and they may have to confront certain situations and people in their mind that to relive it, and it's a very painful, emotional experience. They wouldn't, they're not in enjoying the process per se, but when you come out on the other end, it's like, wow, now I have a different life. So again, when we talk about these sorts of punishments, God's intent is not reprovement. He's not, you were bad in this world, so you're going to the bad place. It's not about reprovement. It's about improvement, but the process along the way can be a difficult one. Gehenna, purgatory, or hell, is, is described in our Judaic literature as a punishment of fire or a punishment of cold. And, and there's Gehenna shall esh, the Gehenna, the hell of fire, and the Gehenna shall sheleg, the, the hell of snow. Now, Again, we have to always, whenever we're talking about spiritual concepts, we have to separate ourselves from physical terms. Again, we're physical people. The only things we kind of understand are physical descriptions. But when we say the hell of fire, right, Gehenna shall Aish or Gehenna shall Shelig, it's not like, okay, I go to one place and it's like Florida, the fire one, and I go to the other place, it's like Antarctica, that's, that's, not, that's not the idea. The idea is that these are anthropomorphic, these are metaphorical terminology to give us a sense of how we can relate to what it means in spiritual terms. Now, what does it mean in spiritual terms? So the punishment of fire or the punishment of cold is based on our lifetime motivations. So it's interesting. In, in Jewish law, in the laws of keeping kosher, so the way in which taste is absorbed into a vessel is done by heat, right? So in other words, if I'm cooking uh, meat in a pot, 
the way in which that meat taste is absorbed into the pot and it becomes a flaschic pot, a meat pot, is through the mechanism of fire. So the way in which I t remove that same taste is, is also through the mechanism of fire. In other words, the same way in which the pot absorbs the taste is the same way in which it is purged. So if I'm boiling, uh, if I'm boiling something and there's water as an intermediary, it's enough for me to use hot water, right, or boiling water as that which extracts the taste that's been absorbed, the non-kosher taste that's been absorbed. If it had direct heat like a grill, Right? So the only way to purge it is through direct heat, like, like with a blowtorch. So if, I, if you want to make your grill that was used for non-kosher meat at one point kosher, you can take that grill, and since it, and since it absorbed the non-kosher meat taste through direct fire, the way in which you purge it is by using the blowtorch, direct fire, uh, and, and blowtorching it out. The same way it absorbed is the same way in which it's purged. And this is a similar way with the soul, the same way in which we are uh, sort of trafing ourselves or making ourselves doing things that are not kosher is the same way that we're purged. So in other words, in other words, the Gehenna of fire, when we talk about, again, it's not a place where you're sitting in fire physically, but it's a person who had too much fiery passion in things that they shouldn't have had fiery passion in. In this physical world, you were too excited and enthusiastic about materialism or about things that are not permitted to us. So the way in which that was the way in which this non-kosher lifestyle was absorbed into our life, so it's purged in the same way. So the analogy that's used is Gehenna of fire, meaning that it's purged in this way. Because you were so, so hot and intense and passionate, it's, it's purged from using this Gehenna of fire, whatever that means in psychological spiritual terms. The same thing with Gehenna of snow, Gehenna of cold. How did it absorb how did your soul absorb this, this scenario? Having a coldness towards mitzvahs, having a coldness towards God and spirituality. If you were just like cold, I'm not interested, leave me alone, I'm an, uh, whatever, I'm somebody, I'm not a non-believer, I don't care, I'm not interested, that's a coldness towards spirituality. And so, again, to purge one of their existence, uh, to purge one of that sort of uh, status would be done through the mechanism of Gehenna shall shelleg, the, the Gehenna of cold, meaning that, again, it's purged in the same way in which it was absorbed. So far, so good? Okay. The, the, last, uh, the, the last idea or opportunity is that the soul can, uh, theoretically, if need be, if there, it was either need something corrected that, could, that, that it left undone, or it did something that needs, it needs another shot at, there is the potential for a Gilgal, for reincarnation, or for Ebor, which is a spiritual pregnancy. And we could talk about that more at length another time. We've discussed it in past um, retreats as well, to go into the, the understanding of reincarnation. I'm sure on the JLI YouTube channel, you could, you could uh, easily find some of our discussions on that. But that is another way in which, again, the soul is corrected. So God judges, and when, whatever way is going to purify and, and rehabilitate the soul in the best way, that is the mechanism that's used. Ultimately, though, as Jews, even the afterlife isn't the end all and be all. We believe that Mashiach is going to come and that those souls that have been in the divine treasure stores of the afterlife will once again be reunited with their body. The resurrection of the dead is the end all and be all. That is where it's at. So it, it's kind of like there's a, there's a story told, there's an analogy given where you have a house that's on fire, and the two witnesses of the house on fire, one of them can't walk, and one of them can't see. There are two people sitting next to each other. 
One can't walk, one can't see. And they say, how are we going to save the people in this burning building? And so the, the one that can't see says, you know what, I'm going to put you on my shoulders, the one that can't walk, on my shoulders, and both will both go in together. I, I'll, we'll use your eyes and my feet, and together we will save the people in this house. Well, so now the, the, everyone was saved from the house, and the mayor comes, and he wants to award, give the key to the city to the hero that saved the day, that saved all these people. They say, well, who should we give it to? And so they start fighting amongst each other. The, the one who can't see says, well, if it wasn't for my legs, you never would have been able to go into the house. Said, well, if it wasn't for my eyes, you never would have been able to see where you're going. And so what the mayor decides to do is he gives both of them a key to the city. And this is the same thing with the body and the soul. The soul says, if it wasn't for me, you wouldn't be alive. You wouldn't have been able to do all of the good deeds in this world. And the body says, but yes, but if it wasn't for me, the whole goal is to make this physical world into a divine place. And that means that you need to engage in a physical world. And the only way that you, soul, can do that is with me, the body. And so God says, you know what? You're both right. You both get the key to this city. And the ultimate is when we experience godliness, not only in the spiritual sense, but after the resurrection of the dead, when the soul and the body are once again reunited. And then in a physical and spiritual way, the ultimate experience of God, experiencing God not only in spiritual terms, but in physical terms as well, that's the ultimate goal. The afterlife isn't the end all and be all. Mashiach and resurrection, that's where it's at. Not downplaying the afterlife. The afterlife's important. But the end goal, the end game, is to make this world into a divine place. And that is realized ultimately during Tchiyas Amesim, during the resurrection of the dead. Just want to conclude with one thought. Everything we do in this world is meaningful. The time that we have here is allotted to us to make a difference. So let's make sure that when you're nearing your end and your life passes before your eyes, that it's something worth watching. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching. Click subscribe and hit the notification bell below for daily pearls of Jewish wisdom.